I'm absolutely amazed at um, some of the comments that Alyssa said and some of the um, word of knowledge that Lorna gave in some of the songs that we sang of how the Holy Spirit orchestrates the service and has it go into the message and it's just all one big total, are you getting it? Here's a message to you. Here's something God wants you to know, God wants you to get. Today, I'm going to conclude our series on grace, the source of life. This is part five. It's on how to wait. We'll talk about that in a second. Open your Bible. It says 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and find Romans chapter 5. We'll be there as well. And in this series, I have taught you um, some important things, how grace works in your prayers, you have a need, you find a promise, you have faith in the one who promised, you ask in prayer, and then you stand or you wait and hope. Today, I wanna to talk to you about number five, how to wait. Have you ever prayed something and asked God for something and in your head, and your mind, it's a big deal, and yet it took a long time for it to happen? Has anyone ever had that happen? Okay, what do you do while you're waiting? I have prayed, and now what do I do? Do I pray again? Do I ask again? Do I ask them another time? Do I keep on asking? I, I, it just, you know, I asked yesterday, and, you know, and it hasn't happened yet, so maybe I should ask again. Well, maybe I didn't ask in faith, so I should ask one more time. It's been a whole week, so maybe I should ask. And it depends on the situation, depends on the request, it depends on what's going on in life, it depends on a lot of things. But today, I want to share with you here in the room and you watching online, what do you do in that meantime? What, do you, what should I be doing while I'm waiting? I'm waiting on God, and why are you taking so long? Have you ever asked that? Oh, come on, a lot more than that have, too. <laughs> Every one of us at one time have wondered. Every one of us has said, well, I prayed for something, but it still hasn't happened, and it's a couple of months later, and, and it's like, what's going on? What's happening? And we have to like live in the, in the moment with the presence of God. So let's go into it. We're going to talk about how to wait in the Lord. What is it? So give you a little snapshot again of just a couple things we have covered. Uh, the difference between, or I'm going to talk to you today about grace and faith. Grace is the things God does for your benefit. Grace is something that God does for you. These are his promises or his word. This is the promise of God or the word of God. These are the things that God has done for you. He has, he's made a promise to you. And it's all in the Bible. He's given you his word. It's in the Bible. Faith is what you do. So remember this concept. Grace is always something God does. Faith is always something you do in his grace. And we go into this a little bit further. And you need to understand that faith is trust or have confidence in or rely on. If you're going to have faith in God, you're going to have to trust in him. You're going to have to rely on him. You're going to have to have confidence in him. Uh, Miss Alyssa told a story about her being in a boat and getting trapped under a waterfall and then a rescue boat coming. Okay, in order to get out of the boat that's sinking into the rescue boat, you have to trust that they are actually there to rescue you. You have to have confidence in that their boat will stay floating. Let's say that you are uh, in the water or in the river and you are drowning and somebody throws you a life preserver attached to a rope and they say, grab it. You have to have trust that that life preserver is going to hold you. You have to have confidence in that piece of rope. You're going to have to rely on it to get you out of danger and get you back into life. Faith is just that. Faith is trusting in God, relying on him, having confidence in him. He is the one throwing you life jackets, life preservers. He's the one that's giving you answers to prayer and called promises. And are you going to latch on to them? Faith activates God's promises, okay? This is really important. Faith works grace. Grace works the word. 
Faith activates the promises of God and the promises of God or the word of God come alive into your life. This faith puts the promises of God into motion, starts the system going. Okay, so I prayed and I believe I had faith and I asked God to do something in my life, but it hasn't happened. Why hasn't it happened? So God in his sovereignty, listen, okay, things I'm gonna share with you today I don't want you to read it, so I'm going to back up. Some things I'm going to share with you today have nothing to do whether you think it's right or wrong. It has to do with, this is the system, and you're going to have to use it. Yet you may say, that's not fair, God. Why should I have to wait? And you may have a lot of reasons of, how come it happened to so-and-so and didn't happen to me? I think I'm a better Christian than so-and-so. How come that person got the job and I didn't get the job? You have to... Okay, we're going to walk through this stuff in your life and in today. But what I need you to understand is God has done something for you and it's going to be his way, not your way. A lot of times we want God to do it our way. We want our way, now way. And he says, no way, my way. Okay, it can happen sometimes. God, now get this, God in his sovereignty decided before creating the first man, Adam, before you were alive, before Adam was alive, God decided in his sovereignty, he didn't ask anybody. He didn't get your approval. He decided that he would create a system for all mankind to be blessed and provided for. God says, this way, I'm gonna do something. He is the originator of equality. He says, I wanna do something that works for everybody, not just certain groups of people, not just smart people or dumb people, not just rich people or poor people, not just brown people or white people. It's going to work for everybody. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your education is. It doesn't matter what your age is or what your sex is. God created a system before anyone ever existed, and he created the system and made it a law, and he called it grace. There is the law of grace where God, Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through the Son. And the Bible says, come to the throne of grace when you need help and, and find mercy and help in the time of need. Come to the throne of grace. God created an entire system, organized the system, staffed the system with angels, organized it, has echelons and command levels, and he has people involved in his kingdom and his system and his, we can call it his business. His business is rescuing people. And he has created it and he's in the system is called grace and you need to acknowledge it and live in it and accept it because that's when your life is going to be the very best. Romans chapter four, verse 16. We're going to get to second Corinthians in just a moment. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all. Now, you need to understand God's system works by faith. Grace is something God does. Faith is what you do. And if you are going to believe God, if you're going to have a prayer answered, if you are going to uh, move forward in life, if you're going to make your Christian life better, it's going to be by faith. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, that's impossible to please God except by faith. So your faith must be in his grace, in his promises. And this is the system. He goes, therefore, it is of faith. That way it can be by grace. It's all on God. God grace is what God does. God promises. God gives his word. Faith is what you do. Your faith is relying on, accounting, uh, holding on to. You're grabbing the rope and the life preserver. And those are the promises of God's word. Grace, the word grace just simply means favor. It is what God provides, favor. Now, when we talk about favor in the eyes of God, when, we, when God is using favor, it doesn't mean that, oh, you're my favorite. You know, uh, it doesn't mean that um, I like you a lot. What favor means is I'm involved in your life to make sure you have the best life possible. And the best life possible is not the one you design and the one that you would like to have or the one you think you should have. It's the one he called you to live. What has he called you to do? What has he called you to live? We are called in many areas of life. 
Lots of areas. I'm called as a pastor. God called me to be a pastor. But I'm also a husband. I'm also a boyfriend to the same woman. I'm also a father and a grandfather. But I'm also a businessman. I'm also an administrator. I'm also a friend, because they have a group of friends. I'm also a lot of things, and so are you. You have lots of hats and lots of callings. It doesn't matter what area of life that you are seeking God in, God wants to grace you in it. He wants to favor you. He wants to give you promises to succeed in that area. God's grace empowers, empowers you to overcome life's trials, difficulties, tests, and sins. And what I'm saying here, what this means is the promises of God are what give you the ability of the authority to say no to sin and yes to faith. It is the promise itself. The book of Hebrews says that the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing. And it goes all the way down to breaking down into your bones and DNA. And it says that the word of God is alive. It is a living thing. It is the energy of life. In fact, if you can think about this, for a moment, if you're studying the book of Genesis at all, You'll find that it says in the second chapter of the book of Genesis where God formed man from the dust of the earth. God took dirt. You're nothing but dirt. That's what we are. We're dirt. He took dirt and formed it and developed it and made a human shell. Then it says that God breathed into the nostrils of Adam. <sighs> And it says he breathed life. He breathed life. There's another time that's very similar to it, and we jump all the way to the New Testament when Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The first one, Adam in the book of Genesis, he got the life of God. In the life of God, energy came into him, the very life itself, the, the thing that caused his heart to start to beat. You could call it electricity. You could call it energy. You could call it uh, whatever you want that is associated with actual life that exploded inside Adam, and he started to live. And in that, God empowers Adam to have life. Then the, Jesus breathes on, the whole, on his disciples and tells them to receive the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit breathes on us. And when he breathes on us, he gives us life. It's not just breath, it's actual energy. It's the anointing. It's the presence of God. It's the thing that, that takes something dead and makes it alive. And what God is saying is his grace, the word of God, that what he spoke is actual living words. It's energy. It is the energy that can come into me that I can hold on to and I can say no to trials, yes to faith. I can overcome difficulties in life. Why? Because I have a promise from God and I have learned how to walk through the promise during the waiting time. Romans 5.17 says, for if by one man's offense death reigned through one, much more those who receive, get this, Oh, gosh, the abundance of grace. Those who receive abundance of grace. This word for abundance could be translated in slang, super grace. A whole bunch. A lot. A magnified into your life. It goes that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, righteousness will, listen, to, look at this, will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Here's what you need to understand. Grace itself, it says, for by one man's offense, death reigned. This is Adam who sinned, caused 
death to come over the entire human race and because of what he did, but what Jesus did, God has come into your life and given you abundance of grace, which would also be understood as different grace for different parts of your life. The grace to be a dad, the grace to be a, uh, a grandfather, whatever it is that you are, a grace to be uh, a, a, an employee or an employer. There is a grace from God that is here for you, the abundance of grace, so that you will reign. You have been called to control your lust. You've been called to control your sins. You've been called by God himself to say no to tri trials and temptation. You've been called to change it from glory to glory. You've been called to walk in righteousness. You have been called to sanctification. You have been called into what God has for your life. You've been called to be you. So quit trying to be someone else and be you because that's where the energy is. The energy or the life, the anointing, the presence of God, whatever term we want to use just to help you get a good image and picture of it is, is in your calling, your lane. Get in your lane and live in your lane and you will find that Jesus called you to live the abundant life. I think you need to listen to this message again just to get to that part. Let's go. Uh, Hebrews chapter four, verse one and through three. Therefore, since, since, and I think you got to grasp this, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Hebrews chapter four is referring to the people of Israel under the leadership of Moses out in the wilderness who griped and complained at different times of the journey because they heard the word but didn't mix faith with the word. And he's telling us they cannot enter into his rest unless you mix faith with the promise. If you don't mix faith with the promise, you're not gonna enter into the rest of God. The rest is necessary for the waiting period. You must experience rest in God in order to enter the waiting period. Verse three, for we who have believed do enter that rest. We must use faith in the promise. We must put our a reliance on what God has said, what God has promised, what God has declared, what he has said he would do, you must do that. Okay, we did this over, over 30 years ago. Uh, the church I was pastoring at the time in Anaheim merged with another church. And the pastor of that church, Alwyn Lewis, uh, was pastoring that church, and he had been in the ministry for 35 years. And he gave us his building and his small congregant, and we merged our church together, and we took over that building and got that property to have a church and to continue to go forward for a number of years. And in return for his faithfulness of 35 years of being in the ministry, he had not one penny in retirement. Not one penny. So what we said as a church, we will take your current salary that you're making right now today and we'll match it and we'll pay it for the rest of your life. And him and I did this. Shook our hands and gave our word. We just gave our word. We just made a promise. He relied on that promise and he relied on that word and just a couple of weeks ago, Suzette and I had the privilege of participating in his burial and him going to heaven, seeing him go to heaven and his wife a, a year earlier. And we made that commitment off our word and never, ever, ever miss. He got a check every two weeks for over 30 years based off a promise. If man could keep that promise, how much better can God We took it as an assignment from God, a calling from God, and that God said, I want to bless this individual through you. 
And because of that, God will prosper us. And so we have a very gigantic seed in missions and in giving that I believe God is going to bring a hundredfold in our future as a church. I believe it. I believe. I believe 25 is going to be better than 24 and 23 and 22 and so forth. Faith, just to remind you again, it's what you do. It's trust, have confidence in, rely on. Faith activates God's promises. In order for the promise to start moving, in order for the system to work, you have to trust. You have to believe what it says. And you have to believe he said it and he will do it. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says this, come to me, all you who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What's interesting is, the Bible will teach us that we do labor, but we're not supposed to have heavy laden. We're not supposed to be worried, but we're supposed to labor. We're supposed to do our job. We're supposed to live our life. We're supposed to go forward. How do we now stand? I'm, we're going to call, how do we wait or stand? How do we rest and what is the rest? I'm looking at the, at the word wait, rest, and stand is all together the same thing. It's all the same process. And that's where we're going to go. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. This is a story of Paul and the thorn in the flesh of Paul. This is a story where Paul was having some struggles and asking God for some assistance. In, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we find an entire list, an entire list of Paul going through all kinds of pressures and troubles, and shipwrecks and floggings and whippings and jail, prison cells and all kinds of stuff. And then in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul challenges the people of Corinth that they are more impressed with people's credentials than people's preaching. They're more impressed with who you might be versus what you might be saying, and Paul wants to put them in place. And in his letter at 2 Corinthians, he helps straighten them out in chapter 11 and chapter 12, and he gets a little satire going, gets a little criticism going, gets a little poking at them. And look at this, it says in chapter 12, verse 1, It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. So here's what he opens up his satire with. He basically says this, I'm so good. I'm going to have more visions, more revelations, because that's what I do. I get them all the time. Visions, revelations. I'm special. And then look at verse 2. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. So we know there's a first heaven, a second heaven, because Paul went to the third heaven. And he says, um, and I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. What we do know is Paul's talking about himself. Paul is talking about an experience he actually had, but he doesn't know if it was his physical body went to the third heaven or just seemed like that. Verse four, now he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one, I will boast, yet of myself, I will not boast except in my infirmities. So here's what Paul is declaring. When God does a sovereign act and gives a vision and gives somebody special understanding and revelation, he goes, Paul's going to say, hey, that's great. Let's boast about that guy because that guy was Paul. Paul was challenging their mindset of the people at Corinth and saying, you guys think so-and-so special and -and so-and-so special. I know a guy. I know a guy. I know a guy. It makes me think of that phrase. I know a guy. He can get you a passport. I know another guy could get you a driver's license. I know another guy could get you a car. You know, I know a guy. And this what Paul's saying. I know a guy. He went way up there. And that man, that guy's cool. But for me, just talking about me, he goes, I'm going to boast in my infirmities or my weaknesses. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. 
for I will speak the truth, but I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears me to be. Now I'm going to move into verse 7 on screen. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. See, we already know Paul's now declaring it's him. He says this, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Paul says that I am at a position of such revelation that it exposed himself to greater attacks and greater pressures because God made a statement to much is given, much is required. And because much is required of Paul, the enemy is attacking him at a greater level because of his greater level of revelations. And don't let that stumble you. Basically, when God is allowing a person to be more influential in the kingdom of God, and there is no one outside of Jesus than Paul. Paul's number two, you know, in history of the influence. There is a greater attack because Paul's moving in a spiritual realm that exposes himself to greater demonic powers. You take another person like Reinhard Bunke. He was an evangelist. He is in heaven right now. He is a German evangelist, and he turned the continent of Africa onto Jesus. He would have hundreds of thousands of people attend a crusade. He was under different kinds of attacks than other people who are not at that level of exposure to spiritual things. You have to understand, the exposure to spiritual things makes him more exposed to angelic beings as well as demonic beings. There's a whole thing we could talk about on spiritual uh, echelon and spiritual things, but I'm trying to get to this particular point more. But, you know, you take someone like Martin Luther, the German priest, Catholic priest who turned the Protestant movement, you know, started it. He was under tremendous amount of pressure, a lot of demonic activity, a lot of angelic activity. And, in, you know, if your thought is, well, then I sure don't want to grow up and be strong in the Lord and have more demons. That's the wrong thinking. You have to understand this message that Paul has. Let's hear it. And he says, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan. Paul clearly says it's a messenger of Satan. He didn't say a messenger of God. He said a messenger of Satan. And he says to buffet. The Greek word for buffet means to be hit again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Imagine if you had a punching bag and you're at a gym. It's a big full body uh, bag and you start punching it and you start punching it, and you punch it over and over and over and over and over, you would be buffeting the bag. And lest I be exalted above measure, concerning this thing, listen to this, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Paul confesses to the entire world. I went to the Lord and said, is there any way I don't have to have these spiritual attacks? Paul is the author of, we do, not write, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and, and spiritual wickedness in high places. Paul, even though at Lystra was stoned and died and taken out of the city to be dead, and then the disciples of that city gathered around him and prayed for him, and he came back to life. He knew it's not the people in the city, it's the demonic activity behind the people. He understands what his, who his enemy is. His enemy is a messenger of Satan who is coming and getting, causing problem after problem. And Paul is saying, could I have the position without the attacks? Could I have the position without the pressure? Could I be really important but also cruise through life? That's what he's saying. And how many times have Christians prayed something similar or have it in their head? something similar. Look at the answer. And he said to me, this is Jesus said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. 
I don't know how many commentators I read where they now comment on this verse and say, see, the Lord said no. I don't see the word no in there at all. Not at all. He declares that my grace is sufficient for you. Paul says, can I get out of my lane for a while and live in a lane that has the same authority and the same benefits, but not the same pressures? That's what he's asking. And Jesus says, my grace is sufficient. Well, what we've learned so far today, grace are the promises of God to get you through life, to cause you to prosper. And Jesus just said, my word will work for you. You are, the, and he's saying that to all of us. My grace is sufficient for you, for, it is made, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. That Paul says, therefore, because the grace of God is what I need during the attacks, how many times you're being persecuted for your faith or you're being attacked or you are having pressure financially, you're having pressure physically. And then you ask God for a special allowance of breaking all the rules of prayer and waiting and, and uh, exercising faith in the promise and just ask him for sovereignly, you know, fix me. Without walking through everything else, you're asking for an escape hatch, which Paul was asking for. He wanted an escape hatch. He wanted to get out of the situation. And then he declares that my grace is sufficient wherever you're at, whatever you're going through, whatever it is that's happening in your life, God's grace is there to empower you to go through it. We're asking God to take us around it and God's asking us to go through it. God is saying, I've prepared you for this moment. God is saying to Paul, he's not saying no, he's saying you can do it with me. And then he says this, Paul says, therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities. The infirmities means my weakness. The areas that I'm most vulnerable, the areas that the enemy can push my buttons, the areas that I can, I can flesh out in. He goes, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul is not saying in this verse, God, bring me problems and I'll hold on and I won't give up. I'll keep my faith. Paul is saying problems are coming. And when I see them come, I think here's another time to show the grace of God will get me through it. God's grace is going to take me through it. The promises of God. The grace of God is God's word to you. God's promises to you. Isaiah 55, 11 says this. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. God's given his word. Life is coming in. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing which I do. Hebrew word for accomplish means to create or to do or to make. So God says, but it shall create or do or make what I please. And what does he please? He pleases what he promised. He pleases his word. He pleases what he declared to you. He pleases what he has promised you. He pleases what that he has said he would do. And it will prosper. The Hebrew word for prosper means to get the job done. True prosperity is you're doing what God called you to do and you're getting the job done through the grace and the blessings of God. And he's saying right here, it shall prosper. It shall get the job done. God says, my word will work. Isaiah, Old Testament, jump hundreds of years into the future. And Paul says, could we do it another way? And Jesus said, my word will get you through it. What I said will happen. What I promise I will do. Isaiah 40, verse 31 but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Waiting on the Lord produces inner strength. It produces inner strength. It gets you stronger and stronger. Waiting on the Lord is the weight lift of Christianity. I knew you'd love that one. Okay. Okay, let's talk about the act of waiting on the Lord. The actual act of waiting on the Lord. Number one, 
When I fill the screen, you can take a picture if you would like. Number one, remember the promise and the promise keeper. This is how you're going to wait on the Lord, okay? The actual act. Okay, I am now going to wait on the Lord. Number one, remember the promise and the promise keeper. Number two, give thanks for past victories. Number three, give thanks for this victory. What are you going through right now? What are you being tried? What is the pressure? What is causing you to get on your knees to pray? Thank God for the victory. Number four, do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Waiting on the Lord is not sitting and doing nothing. True waiting on the Lord is following the voice of the Holy Spirit. You enter into rest by entering into the promise that God has given you, and now you are activating the promise and working the promise. For an example, let's say I've asked God for more money because I don't have enough money to uh, pay my bills and provide for my family, and I need more money. I go to the scriptures and I find promises on prosperity. I find promises on God's provision. I find promises on God giving me food and clothing and these kind of things. And I use those promises. Now, while I'm waiting for my new job, I may actually have to look for a job. I may have to try to get a raise and look for a job or add a second job to this time period of my life in order, because I will be graced by God to work the two jobs or get the new job or get the raise. You catching this? Okay, give you another example, the opposite. I don't care how much, I don't care how many scriptures you find on health and blessing of health. There are a lot of them. And you pray them and you ask God, over and over to lose weight. But yet, you don't do anything that the Holy Spirit tells you to do. And you're worth your half gallon of ice cream watching a movie and asking God to help you lose weight. Not going to happen. Prayer is not going to happen. You could have all the faith you want but you've proven you don't have any because you're not exercising what the Holy Spirit's telling you to do because he will challenge you. You could pray all you want to be physically fit, be physically fit, have big old arms, be strong, be healthy, like Pastor Josh. You, but if you never, ever do anything like take a walk, do push-ups, do some uh, weightlifting, do something. If you don't do anything, that prayer is just going to sit there and be flat. You need to do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. If you say, I haven't heard him tell me to do anything, what do I do if I don't know what he's saying? The answer is, do the last thing you believe he told you. Because he's not going to tell you the next until you do the first. It's better than you're responding. Waiting is not sitting doing nothing. Waiting is being actively involved in life. Waiting is not making it happen. It's being led by the Spirit so it can happen. Waiting isn't manipulating God. Waiting is cooperating with God, where you have an inner witness. You know, I should go do this. And who knows? You may be asking God for financial blessing, for more income, and God asks you to make a pie for a neighbor down the street that you heard is not feeling that well. I'm just making stories up, okay? But that could lead to blessing you because you're blessing someone. I have found one thing to be true for all needs, whatever your need is, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, whether it's mental, doesn't matter. There's somebody in a greater need than you. And if you start sowing into their life, even with prayer, other people start praying for you. 
When you take the attitude, I don't, I can't focus on other people's prayers. Too much is happening in my life. You have made you the center of your life instead of Jesus. The Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over shall men give into your life, into your lap, into your bosom. New King James, King uh, bosom and NIV lap. Uh, but what you need to gasp, grasp and understand is that the Lord is saying, give prayer and other people will pray for you. Give finances and other people will give to you. Get involved in life. Why, here's the big question, why is it taking time? Come on, God, why? Why are you taking so long? Most of the time, I'm gonna go out on the limb on this one and say 98 to 99% of the time when someone says, God, why are you taking so much time? It's a person isn't understanding the process and what's taking place. And the person is thinking God is holding it back. God, you're all powerful. Why don't you just do it? Now, there are a lot of things in life that God works through other people to get it accomplished and that requires obedience from others. And how many times have you stopped someone else's prayer from being answered because you weren't obedient? Just a thought process, something to think about. But when you start asking why, why is it taking time? What, what is taking so long? Let me give you some reasons why. You ready? Thank you, Ernie. And thank you for watching online, yelling, yes, I heard you from home. They, they're not asleep. They're just amazed. Their eyes are all wide open and they're just staring at me. Why is it taking time? Number one. The Lord will always do what is best for you and others. He will always have it in a process of time that gets his biggest reward, his biggest reaping harvest out of it. Number two, the Lord is building hope. And you're going to understand this in just a few more scriptures. Is building hope in your heart. Hope is very, very, very important. It, the, the process of waiting, the process of of Remember, I, I told you the act of waiting is part of it is praise, part of it is thanksgiving, part of it is remembering past vis victories, part of it is thanking God for current victories. And it's, at the time, hope is increasing in your life. And the promise of God produces hope. And hope is something faith can attach itself to. The vision inside your head has to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Number three, timing is in the hands of the Lord. There are some things that are just in the hands of the Lord. No one can explain. No, everyone, can, everyone has an opinion, and that's all it is. It's an opinion, and, but it belongs to God. Timing belongs to God. And there are reasons, there are things that will be happening that we won't understand until we are in heaven, and you suck it up. Second Peter, okay. Did you want to take a picture? Okay, you got that done? Good. Second Peter 3, nine. Listen to this. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the Lord will always base promises and fulfillment of the promises. Can he get more people into the kingdom? Is there a way to get more? Is there a way to pull people in? And it's, it's saying that he has his own timing. In Psalms 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. The waiting process actually makes my heart stronger, more dedicated to God, more attached to him. Isaiah 40, 31, and I'm dumping a bunch of scriptures on you right now. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not weary. They shall walk and not faint. There's the scriptures that are telling us the waiting process is a building process, a building up process, a dependence on the Lord, making me stronger, making me more spiritual, making me more confident in him and his promises. Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. I asked you to go to Romans 5. Open your Bibles. This is where we're at. Therefore, having been justified by faith, get this. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, which I've read to you several times in this series, as well as this verse. 
through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand or rest or wait, which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Continue in the same chapter. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, the ability not to give up. And perseverance, character, the ability to be sanctified, godly, and holy. And character, the more I walk in godliness, the more I will have hope. The more I don't give up, the more I hold on, the more I hold on to that promise of God, the more I am developed in spiritual maturity and the more hope I have, I see a bigger hope. There are, might be some times where you think you're waiting for God for a long time, but what God is doing is percolating spiritual strength in you for a future attack that you're gonna need more strength than you have right now. Verse five. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Here's what he says. Your hope that is developed during the time of waiting makes you more spiritually, makes you spiritually stronger and it makes you more dependent on the Holy Spirit. And that's the whole process of God turning you into a disciple and making you better and stronger. How to wait on the Lord in prayer. How to actually do this in prayer. Okay, how do I apply it to a moment of prayer? I'm gonna tell you how, then we're gonna stand and we're gonna do it. So here's, what we're gonna, here's how you do this at prayer. Pause on prayer purpose sense the presence of the Lord. Pause. Eyes closed. Thinking of nothing but Jesus. Sense. Welcome and invite his presence. I like to think this. Okay, this is me. Okay? It's me. This is letting you into some very, very personal things. Uh, what I'm about to say, I've never told anybody, not even my wife. I like to sit and think with my eyes closed and pretend, envision, see Jesus walk into the room, walk over to me like I've done to my grandkids a thousand times with arms wide open and grab me and hold me. I can feel his presence. Just close my eyes and pause and sense the presence of the Lord. Petition. Let your personal needs be known. So this is what's going on in my life and this is where I need some help. Petition. Three, praise. But praise is accept the promise and expect the promise which is really hope. Have a moment in that waiting time in these three little steps to let hope arise. I'm not gonna die, I shall live. I'm not gonna lose my job. I shall excel and if the company doesn't, God's got another place for me. Hope just gets bigger and bigger dependent on God, not on your qualifications, your abilities, and your ability to sell yourself to another company, but God providing. This is what we're talking about. Pause, petition, praise. Would you stand? This is waiting on the Lord. This is when you're thinking, what's going on? Why is it taking so long? And this is when during prayer, what you would do, an exercise you can actually do. You can pause, you can petition, and you can praise. And the area of petition is, might be just like the dad who had a demonic oppressed son, and he asked Jesus, he said, help my un unbelief. And you can just say, 
help me, Lord, get through this next step or the next part of this. Whatever it might be, give me more strength. It could, doesn't really matter. Or it could be, I have a new petition to bring to you and I know your promises. And then we enter into a praise. So I'm going to ask you right now to actually do what we're talking about today. I ask if you just take a moment, everybody close their eyes. Just close your eyes. And right now, I want you to envision Jesus. I want you to think about him. And let the presence of the Lord come on you. share your weakness and receive his strength. During the praise, during the praise, accept and expect. give you praise and glory and honor. We thank you, Lord. We magnify your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Thank you, Lord. Let's lift our hands and give them glory and praise and honor. Thanksgiving. We worship you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Hallelujah.